Good morning, Pastor Dawson here for Sunday, July 5th. I hope you're uh, staying safe and uh, keeping sane in this uh, world of insanity that we seem to be living in, where people are bickering and yelling and screaming and arguing and uh, expressing their perspectives and their opinions. It seems to never end. The other day I was uh, checking my emails and I saw this one from a friend of mine who is a staunch Lutheran and he's arguing with a staunch Catholic about whether or not uh, Martin Luther was outlawed by the Pope. Now this is something that happened 500 years ago. And it's just pages and pages of these two gentlemen uh, bickering and fighting about who's right and who's wrong and uh, a lot of intellectual triviality and a lot of uh, self-righteous uh, opinions and perspectives and pompous attitudes and it seems to be going absolutely nowhere like a revolving door a vicious circle a never-ending story without accomplishing much of anything except uh, uh, getting uh, people uh, angry and uh, and uh, um, mad at each other and that seems to be the type of world that we're living in today where everybody has to express their opinion. Everybody has to express their perspective. And there's all this bickering and arguing. And it just completely surrounds us. And it seems to permeate everything that uh, we see happening around us and in our lives. Uh, the other day I was uh, checking out a website called uh, uh, The Daily uh, Bible Group. And it's a website I belong to. And all of a sudden, on the website, I saw these uh, words pop up by the moderator, whose name is Phil. And uh, this website is supposed to be simply for biblical uh, passages, uh, prayerful insights, uh, biblical insights, these type of things. And he says there, Please do not post personal or political arguments on this page. I removed an argumentative post this morning on the COVID thing. It will not be tolerated. Keep your face mask opinions to yourself. This is not the place for your personal beliefs or anything other than the Bible. And that in truth only. This is a Bible group, so let's keep it that way. Thank you, love and blessings, Phil, the moderator. And then he goes on and he explains, thankfully I caught it early and there was no dispute. And thankfully the vast majority of our members don't engage these people peddling argumentative, argumentative hobby horse topics anyway. So you are correct in saying that disputes and arguments shouldn't take place because they typically don't. People are here for the word of God, not the words of an opinionated a person pushing a Trojan horse into our midst. We are truly blessed that those who are here for the right reasons are all on the same page. And yes, we should pray for these people and this group as well. Thank you. And then I posted something that I wrote a few weeks ago entitled, It's Just My Opinion. It's just my opinion and how true that is because everybody has an opinion. I think, I believe is a God-given capacity that makes us truly unique as human beings, which means there are seven billion opinion makers in this world, each capable of saying, I believe, I think this to be true. And that's okay. It's a God-given privilege to be able to express one's opinion and believe it to be true. But remember, there are seven billion other opinions in this world and no two are exactly the same because no two life experiences are exactly the same and that is why it's just your opinion one of seven billion so to expect everyone else to think exactly like you is humanly impossible that's why expressing your opinion is just that it's your opinion Nothing less and nothing more. And that's my opinion. And uh, Phil, the moderator, said the very true and insightful Eric, and that is why people have the right to post their opinions on their own pages. And one would think that when one is in a Bible group with clear guidance, guidelines about keeping it biblical, that one could comprehend the meaning of that. One would think. And I responded by saying, yes, how true that is. 
and thank you for all your dedicated time and effort in monitoring this website. God bless you. And he responded, thank you, brother. You're welcome. Blessings as well. You know, and when this was all over, I kind of thought to myself, you know, <laughs> Uh, we as human beings have been arguing and bickering since the beginning of time. It's part of our nature, I guess, our human nature. In fact, one of my favorite movies is 2001 Space Odyssey. And at the very beginning of the movie, it shows uh, two ape-like, human-like tribes of people, small groups of people moving down this one valley towards each other. They don't know that they're coming towards each other. I guess they're looking for food. And they end up meeting each other in this uh, middle area that's full of dry bones of dead animals. And immediately the leaders of each group uh, come out and step out and confront each other in an argumentative, bickering way, trying to scare the other one off with all sorts of powerful grunts and groans and, mo and motions. And one of them just happens to pick up this big femur bone off the ground from one of the dead animals. And you know, femur bone is long and it's got the round ends on it. And he's using this femur bone as an exclamation point for his argumentative uh, gestures and grunts and groans trying to scare the other people off and to prove that they belong in this valley and not them. And as he's swinging this thing around, he inadvertently hits the other leader on the head and knocks him to the ground. And all of a sudden, to much to his surprise, he says, hey, I've won the argument. So he throws this bone up in the air in a sense of jubilation. And it's rotating this big femur bone. And the next thing you see is a space station that looks like a big femur bone, long with the round ends rotating through space, basically saying, you know what? Our human nature hasn't changed in thousands of years. We're still bickering and arguing. And one of the fascinating things you see in the Gospels is that Jesus is always being confronted by the scribes, the Pharisees, and the rabbis. They're always bickering and arguing with him, trying to get him involved in intellectual trivia, in self-righteous elitism. Uh, they were so good at it that they actually had a book called the Talmud. You may have heard of the Talmud. It's a very voluminous Jewish holy book. And it's a collection of thousands upon thousands of arguments between rabbis. And then even more arguments by later rabbis about what the early rabbis were arguing about. Yes, that's what you study to be a rabbi. Arguments. Tell me, what other religion has a sacred book of arguments. And that's what Jesus was confronted with daily from these people. And he had to contend with them to some extent. But if you notice, Jesus never really gets involved to the extent of all this intellectual trivia and all this self-righteous elitism and trying to prove an opinion or to prove somebody else wrong or whatever. But he was more of a man of action, of putting his words into action. He was not interested in getting involved in a war of words, which accomplishes usually absolutely nothing. He was interested in furthering the kingdom of God through acts of, of, of turning those words into, into action, words of kindness and mercy and love and compassion and forgiveness. That's how he was going to further the kingdom of God, not through arguments and opinions and perspectives which in the long run accomplish absolutely nothing. And that's why he chose men of action. He didn't go to the highfalutin seminaries and choose uh, uh, men that were involved in intellectual trivia. He didn't go to the pompous religi religious centers uh, to choose men that were involved in self-righteous elitist uh, opinions and arguments. No, he just chose some basic common folk who knew how to put their words into action. But he also warns them in our gospel lesson for today that it's a lot harder 
to put your words into action, to spread this kingdom, especially words of kindness and mercy and love and compassion and forgiveness. Oh, it's easy to sit around and get involved in intellectual triviality and uh, self-righteous, pompous, argumentative uh, situations. But to actually get out there in the streets and turn your words into action, he says to him today, means that you have to trust your heavenly father as a child trusts his own father. You have to be willing to hold on to your father, heavenly father's hands as you go out into this world to turn those words into words of, of, of actions of kindness. It's just an amazing concept that still exists for us today. We are his disciples today, and we're called to turn our words into action, actions of kindness. If we're going to say words, let them be words of, of kindness and support and concern and sympathy and empathy and encouragement. We're also called to turn our words into actions. Let our actions speak louder than words. Let our actions speak for themselves. It's like Victoria in her sermon that she so eloquently said last week. You know, just a cup of cold water, a piece of bread, uh, 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 an article of clothing, a few words of kindness and support and encouragement. That's all it takes. And that's where all we're called to do, especially during these difficult times. So guess what I Googled uh, the other day? I Googled uh, random acts of kindness during coronavirus outbreak, and believe it or not, I got random acts of kindness during the coronavirus outbreak dated June 16th of this year by the Mental Health Foundation. And it says the coronavirus outbreak has taken a lot of us by surprise. Some people have described it as a nightmare that they wish they could turn off, while others have said they feel like the entire world has been turned upside down. And then it goes on and says, so where do random acts of kindness come in? One thing that we have seen all over the world is that kindness is prevailing in uncertain times. People are coming together to sing on balconies in Italy. Others are setting up groups to offer support to the elderly or vulnerable, like collecting groceries or calling them for a chat. We have heard stories of people having virtual movie nights and creating choreographed dances over video chat to share with the world. And then it goes on to say, the added benefit of helping others is that it is good for our own mental health and well-being. It can help reduce stress and improve your emotional well-being. In short, doing good does you good. But it's not easy, <laughs> especially during this time where you're somewhat limited. So you're going to have to be, you know, creative if you're going to turn your words into action. It's something that we learn to place our faith and trust in the Heavenly Father. It's something that I learned, you know, over the years. You know, I remember my first um, visit to a soup kitchen while I was being confirmed at that Episcopal Church in Elk Grove. I remember all the ministries we started at Lutheran Church of the Master to help reach out to the community and to put our words into action. I remember the, all the ministries we started at uh, St. Philip in Glenview. We actually had uh, 10 ministries in which we offered free stuff to the needy without costing the church anything. You know, free food, free dog food, free clothing, uh, free meals, uh, free toys, uh, free library books, uh, free gardening, free counseling. It went on and on and on. But it all took our desire to be those who put our words into action. That's what it took. And that takes our heavenly trust in the Heavenly Father. We almost have to become childlike and hold on to His hand as we move out into this world 
in faith. And that's my challenge to you as well. So have a good day. Stay safe and uh, try to stay sane and to spread that, san that sanity as well. God bless. Thank you.